rock stars take Southwest? Well, I mean, I do. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I wouldn't even necessarily call myself a rock star. I'm a you know I'm an icon on a budget is what I like to call it. You know, right. I I got better uses for my money than you know a comfy seat for an hour. It's like give me a fucking break. We we got to talk about this. All right. <laughs> Hello, beautiful human. I'm Zach. Uh, that is Dan. Yo. And I can't believe uh, that Corey Taylor is in the Woo! studio. Hey. I drove here too, man. How the shit? Well, I didn't, well, I didn't walk yourself? here. They led me, but you know, I got me. I got here myself. I'm pretty proud of it. Wow! Like you, you rented a car. I rented a car. Dude. I got, yeah, I got a, like a third hand X2 that has no HDMI thing in it. So like my my phone's dying. <laughs> I'm reading. I'm like, don't you die before I get to the fucking studio? I was like panicking, man. I'm just okay, but you definitely have a lot of money. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, no, hold on. So I'm not rich. I'm well to do. How about that? That's you know. I was gonna say, because y y you are, by all senses of the definition, an icon on a budget. And, we discussed this. I yes. mean, you know. <laughs> and is there a reason that's deeper than just wanting to save a penny as to why you choose to do things yourself and fly Southwest and? Rent a car yourself when you really could have had just a driver pick you up. And well, I don't. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, probably because I'm from Iowa. Yeah, I'm so used to driving myself and doing everything anyway. You know, it's like if we had asked people to do that for us back in the day, we probably would have got like when we had landed in Des Moines, there'd been people going, "Really, <laughs> really," and then they just kick the shit out of us, and we go home going, "Oh, fine, all right." Um, no, nah, I mean, it's just that's the way you grow up. You you. You drive yourself, you shop for yourself, you handle things yourself, you pay your own bills, you take care of your family. Like, that's just what, you, you're, what you're supposed to do, you know? Just because I fucking make music and I dance around on stage like a dick doesn't mean I'm better than anybody else. That is true. You know, Everybody exactly. shits, right? Like, It's the people who are up their own ass that give me fucking gas. Let's put, let's put it that way. It's, it's people like that that make this, this whole real life discussion so amazing. It's like, you drive your own car? I'm like, well, of course I do. Like, what the fuck, <laughs> man? It's true. like, just because I'm like, you know, I've done some shit doesn't mean I've lost the ability <laughs> to fucking drive around a city on my own. Dude, you should see it when I'm, I had a dude today, I was standing in line to get on my Southwest flight and he goes, what are you doing here? And I was like, <laughs> I mean, what are you doing here? You know, we're about to take a fucking plane. You know, it's, I love that it shocks people because they don't expect it. Like they think that everybody wakes up in a glass container and they rise up and <laughs> six people come out and bathe them with fucking bikini well, oil or some by shit. The way, some people do have a ritual I know, like that. And they're fucking assholes. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm the asshole. They're just ridiculous. <laughs> You, you, how do you maintain your voice? I honestly, dude, I don't know. To be honest, I, I think part of it's genetic. I'm just a little interesting. I, it's it snaps back a little fast. I mean, not as quickly as it used to, obviously, because I'm fucking pushing death. But <laughs> um, you know, I I don't drink anymore. I don't smoke. I try to eat as well as I can. You know, while also maintaining a big fat ass. I drink copious amounts of coffee. I just try, I, I exercise, I drink tons of water. Obviously, I live in Las Vegas, the great kiln, so I have to drink tons of water. I think it's just a little bit of, you know, uh, genetic, and I think it's a little bit of maintenance. Well, like, at what point did you realize that it was a genuine instrument that took care? Oh, no, love? I've known that since day one, man. Like, you, because when you're a singer, all the problems fall on you, you know, like the guitar players can change their strings. The drummers can change their sticks or their heads or whatever. If you're on stage and you sound like a frog that's being hit with a fucking hammer. I mean, there's no hiding. You're just like, hi, <laughs> having a bad night tonight, guys. You know, I mean, it's, it's what it, you just kind of have to deal with it. You know, it, the thing for me is the best thing that I've ever learned is how to get by with with a sore throat or when i'm sick or you know when i'm deal when i'm having to deal with like allergies or weirdness i mean cuz you just never know it's it's very temperamental and when you're you know especially when i was drinking and smoking 
it was a little harder to, to maintain, you know? I mean, there was a different timbre to it, but for the most part, if you took care of yourself to the best of your ability, you could get through a tour. You could get through this. You could get through that. And, you know, kind of running the gambit, like that boot training, I learned how to kind of, I don't want to say cheat, but to get by on it, you know, so I wouldn't have to cancel shows. I hate canceling shows. So for me, as I've gotten older, I've learned not to panic if my voice is feeling weird. You know, if there's a certain, I know there's a certain quality to my scream and a way that I can slide between the scream and my, my melodic that when it's working really well, it feels very natural. And when it's not there, I have to manipulate it and I have to kind of go to the, the, the playbook and, and figure out how to get through it. But it's taken years to figure that out. Your grandma really give shows you rock and roll, but yeah. how do you realize that you can make screaming sound pleasing? I tell you what, man, I didn't really know that I could scream until I joined Slipknot. Cause I was a, I was a punk kid, you yeah. know? So I was, I was you a punk a kid before Slipknot. Yeah. Do I had Stone Sour? Yeah. But Stone Sour wasn't nearly as heavy as it was when we reformed it. And I kind of did that out of necessity because of the music that we were writing at the time. They kind of melded the old stuff with the new stuff, basically. Um, when when Stone Sour first started, it was, it was heavy-ish. But it, it was definitely more of like a Soundgarden kind of uh, Pearl Jam, Metallica vibe. You know what I mean? Like... It had elements of that. There were no screaming, but I was still very animate or animated, excuse me. I, you know, I went for it as hard as I could, you know. So we, Stone Sour and Slipknot were the two big dogs in town, you know, and largely because of me, like because of the show that I would put on, the songs that I was writing, uh, you know, what we were able to do as a band, everything was really starting to kind of click. And then Slipknot came along and they were just this whole other beast that i loved you know um but it wasn't until i joined slipknot that i even attempted that voice um i knew that i could go aggressive but i had never like pushed it you know andy their original singer was so fucking good dude like his growl was some of the deepest shit that i've ever heard i mean it was and still to this day is really good but he didn't have that extra level that i could go to so I really kind of learned from him and tried to kind of marry my style to what he was doing. What is this story there? Because you joined that band pretty early on. I joined it in 97. They had been together for about two years. We'd actually done shows together, Stone Sour and Slipknot. Um, we all knew each other. And like I said, we were like the two big, big, big gigs in town. And Slipknot was really starting to get some traction. Uh, they came to me and they were just like look man we want to make it we want to be the one of the you know we want to get signed we want to tour we want the dream is that what you want and i was the guy in stone sour that did all of that shit you know like i was the one out missing Lollapalooza because i was flyering you know like i was the one you know going down and having tapes duplicated and printing out the, the, the cassette, you know, inserts and cutting them out myself and f stuffing them and walking, dude, I sold that shit door to door basically, you know I mean? <laughs> that's what I was doing. So they saw that not only was I the guy in the band on stage, but I was also the guy behind the scenes working his ass off. Um, and that's not to say that anybody else in stone sour wasn't, but I was the one that was driven. I was so driven. And because they saw that, they came to me and they were like, we want you to give us that extra element because I was the best in town. So when I first joined, it was me and Andy. And he was doing, because he had been singing main, main vocals and playing percussion. So when he wasn't playing, Clown would take over and Andy would sing. Uh, so he went to like more of a backup thing and would play percussion. And I was handling like the majority of like the main vocals, but, and I can't blame him for this. It wasn't enough for Andy. 
You know, like he wanted to be a singer, man. He wanted yeah. to be the guy. He wanted to be the man, you know, and because of the way that it was handled. And I don't know a lot of the politics behind it because at the time I was, you know, the new guy. So I didn't get a lot of that story. I know that it rubbed Andy the wrong way. And I was one of the first to go to him and, and apologize because I want, and I wanted to try and keep it together. And I was like, is there any way we can make this work? And he said, dude, it's not you. It's like, this is some shit that's been coming for a minute. And this just made my mind up for me. He's like, I wish you all the luck. I wish you everything, but I'm going to go do my thing. And that's one of the reasons why he and I still talk. Let's dissect something here for a sec. All because right. you've said before that Slipknot is a bunch of people who aren't friends, whereas Stone Sour is a bunch of people who are friends. Right. But there's a difference in the trajectory of the two groups, obviously because Very. you leave one to go to the other, but there was something that was pulling you to, to Slipknot. It, you know, it was the it was the frenetic energy of it. It was the fact that it was so different than anything I'd ever heard, man. I mean, when the the, the first time I saw Slipknot, it was literally the 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 night uh, before we were playing the same club. And first of all, they didn't even walk on stage. They walked through the audience. They came through us <laughs> all in mass. Fucking awesome. I mean, Crazy. it was the craziest <laughs> shit I'd ever seen. And here I'm standing up front going, what in the <laughs> shit is about to happen? I Because nobody, they hadn't played any music for anybody. They hadn't done anything. And then all of a sudden, here they come, dude. It was a fucking force of nature. And you could feel the hunger on that stage you could feel the intensity i mean they were right fucking here dude and i i was just <laughs> and i'd never done this before and i've never done it since i remember i was standing there and i said i'm gonna be the singer for this band and literally a year later is when they asked me like it was crazy dude i was, I was blown away i so it what it was about them was the fact that I wanted to try it because I loved the music. I'd never done anything that gnarly before, but I knew that there was something in me that needed that music so I could unleash that voice. You what know is, what I mean? What is it like entering into a group with a bunch of really intense, creatively right. driven human beings? And not only do you have to be the face of it, right? You want you have to now inject your own thoughts and creativity into a process that has existed years prior. Right. The great thing about that band is from from the jump, they told me they were like, "You're going to be the face. You're going to be the voice." Before you know, any other band that you you get into, there's usually that war, like yeah. jockeying for the position. But they all, they from, they told me from day one, it's like, you're going to be the front man, so you need to handle it. Now, looking back on it, it's almost funny because Joey was a front man and Clown is clearly a front man, you know? So they all kind of took their position and became another kind of, for, but there were so many people in the band, you almost need three front <laughs> men at that point, you know? Um but everybody kind of had their thing. They allowed me to find myself before we actually hit, you know what I'm saying? Because like I said, I'd never done music like that before. So right up until we went in to the studio to make the first album, I was still discovering who I was in that band because for years I was, you know, Corey from slip or from stone sour, I was, you know, the guy who, you know, had all this talent, but nobody sees it, you know? It wasn't until I got into Slipknot that it was, that's Corey, this is the shit that he went through when he was a kid. This is the shit that he's had to deal with his whole life. This is the shit that, you know, I didn't know about, but I relate to it. I didn't know about it, but I relate to it. It took me time to find that, you know? And those guys encouraged me to do it, which I'd never felt before, you know, like there'd never been a dynamic like that in a band that I'd ever been a part of. It was always 
you know, you're either going to be the boss or you're going to know your place. And it was like, fuck that shit. You know, that's not how, you, that's not how a collective works. Totally. And at the end of the day, you all are representative of that brand. Exactly. And it's all of you. I think it helped also that we were fans of each other's work. You know, you we respected each exactly, other. Exactly, man. I and mean, the respect was totally there. And there was never a doubt. You know, there was not one person in that band that was a fucking slouch. Even the people who came and went. See, that's like like-minded people, right? right. Real recognizes real. You can right. be successful with a group of people and not necessarily need to call them friends. Well, and that's the thing, you know, I know that that quote has been taken and, and run with for a lot yeah. of people. But what people don't realize is that there's something so much more than friends. Totally. You know what I mean? Like the the guys in Slipknot, it, it's family. That's like, that's so much deeper than just a friendship. You know, I'm in bands with people who I'm friends with those people, but we're not close. You know what I mean? Like yeah, but we, family's different. Exactly. And that's, and that's the real difference. Like when we get on the road with Slipknot, it takes us a second to kind of knock the rust off of our relationships. The playing always just kicks right in. Like we've, like, I've never seen a band like Slipknot where rust just does not stick to us for some reason. I mean, we can walk on stage with literally no rehearsal and we sound like we've been touring for two weeks, three weeks. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, I've never seen it. It's meant to be. Exactly. But that means that something has to have work and that's where the relationships in the band have come. Yeah. That That's what we've really had to work on is embracing each other for who we are and not who we want each other to be. You know what I'm saying? Totally. Like, like that's, and that's psychosocial behavior. And that's where that term came from because that's when we really started to talk about trying to get on another level. We were like, we had all spent so much time pushing against each other or pushing at, pushing away from each other that we forgot all the great shit that we had done together. And that we appreciated about one another. And that, to me at least, was where I really tried to change my ways and change the things that I said and my approach to how I, you know, appreciate everybody. Did the masks also affect how the success, because you guys are all hiding behind this thing, it's like people are just staring at your face the whole time? A little bit, you know. I mean, it definitely took the impetus off of it for a second, but at the same time, the masks were never a, a, a wall. It was, that was our, our way to connect with the audience. You know, I, in a weird way, we, we, I think our mindset was, I don't even know if people would connect with us with our just regular faces, really? you know, you would need this mask to really understand what the fuck's going on in this music because it's so crazy, you yeah. know? So at least for me, my connection to the music has always been through the mask. Like when I put that mask on, it allows me to unleash that person who I kind of keep at bay for normalcy. And it allows me to kind of use that voice that I need, you know, it's that, it's that pressure valve to be able to, you know, kind of tap and, and let it off. But do you feel like you're ch getting the same thing out of your audience? Like they come to your shows for the exact same stuff? Uh, yeah. I mean, well, there's definitely a difference between a stone sour audience, a solo audience, whether it's electric or acoustic in that respect and a slipknot audience. I don't think they would want that human aspect because for them yeah. that ma my mask is their mask, you know, in a, in a weird way, you know, that's from day one, we encouraged people to create their own mask and bring it to shows. You know, it's like, fuck that skin that you have to drag around, put on your face and get out, you know, and come to a show and, and be yourself. Now we realize what that, that message actually is, is don't be ashamed of who you are, yeah. wear that person on the inside, on the outside and fuck what everybody thinks. That's cool. It's I mean, actually really powerful. I mean, it's incredibly powerful. It's, it's one of the things that we've always tried to lead with. And maybe it's because we're from Iowa and because I mean, we were judged for so fucking long about who we were. I mean, we were all, I mean, we came from the fringe and 
what we represented was something that to this day is still anathema to a lot of people in Iowa. There are a lot of people in Iowa who are, that are very ashamed of the fact that Slipknot comes from there. And it's because of this newfound resurgence in conservative bullshit. It's, you know, that's as, as much as Iowa, when I was there, was a purple state. It's very red now. And there's a lot of people who I know who are not happy about it. It's just like, where the, where, where's all the progress that we fucking made over the last 30 years for fuck's sake. Isn't it crazy to think that like people would be disappointed in the fact that Slipknot has come from Iowa. That just makes not, no sense. Not if me. you come from there, not if you know, <laughs> you know the know people, it, there's yeah. a lot of fucking dicks <laughs> just, who still live in Des Moines, Iowa that are so mad. I know dudes that I've known for 30 years. I run into them and they give me this, they side eyed me hard. Really? Oh fuck. Yeah, dude. There's so many bitter pricks in that goddamn town. And they're just hanging on, you know, like they just don't want to accept the fact that they, they didn't want it as much as we did, you know, and I'm not going to sit here and say that they didn't deserve it because there were a lot of great bands in this, in the, in this scene that we came out of, but for whatever reason, they didn't push hard enough. And even when we did make it and we tried to shine that spotlight, on the Des Moines scene, because it was almost in a weird way, like a pseudo Seattle moment. There was a lot of people yeah. kind of, you know, trolling through uh, Des Moines to try and find the next Slipknot. Everybody who we tried to help blew it. They just didn't fucking want it as much as we did. You know, I mean, we would have lived and died for the shit. And these guys just thought it was a crumb. Do you think that's the difference between somebody who makes it and somebody who doesn't? I think it's part, I think it's part of it. You know, I mean, I'm not going to deny the fact that a lot of it's luck. You know what I mean? We were the right band at the right time. There was something about us that appealed to us or to appeal to people. People liked my voice. People liked the music. People liked the, the incredible energy of it. So the work ethic, the talent, but luck had a lot to do with it, man. So I, I, I don't know. It was that weird witch's brew that you just don't, you don't know why it's so fucking good, but it is, you know? Um, but I know that had we not worked as hard as we did and had we not been as good as we were, we wouldn't have had a third of what we have today. How were you making records in the studio? Like, how does it start? Does it start with a story? Does it start with people jamming? Like, what was that? I mean, like? a lot of it, especially in the, the first album, man, it came from, we would start fucking with something in, in Clown's basement and we would just almost worry at it like a dog with a bone. We would just keep fucking with it and fucking with it and fucking with it. And then someone else would have, like if we couldn't get past that riff, somebody else would go, wait, I've got something, try this. And it would, I mean, it was very organic, man. Like I remember Mick, started fucking around with the uh, the beginning for surfacing. And we thought it was so cool that we we just we just riffed on that for like a good 10 minutes, just just kind of fucking with it. And I think it was Joey had the idea for the main riff, the da -na 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 -da -na -na, you know, and he was just like, do this, but then really lay into the top of the riff. Don't just go, ah, 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 you know, you know, Joey was like, you gotta, you gotta dig, you gotta go, and that's why it sounds so different. It's like, it's not enough to just have the open and the one, you gotta give it that flair. And then between Mick and Paul, they were the ones that kind of took it even further into that the, honestly, that that Florida vibe where it's just, there's a suffocation vibe to a lot of those riffs that we kind of took and made our own. You know what I mean? Like just the it was so it was always so much more than new metal, even though we were included in that genre. It was always we were hardcore. We were death. We were new metal. But we were also, you know, just all of these other fucking elements that we just kind of took and just fed it through the Slipknot you know, filter. And that's how, because there were no limits, we just knew that we could get away with anything. 
How do you explain or define Slipknot's impact on like history and culture? Oh, dude, I have no idea, to be honest. I mean, it's so weird. I, like, to this day, when I see people, whether it's in in just in normal life or I see people like one of Brad Pitt's kids was wearing a Slipknot hoodie, <laughs> and I was just like, what the fuck? I mean, it's a trip, you know? Um, We never thought that we would permeate the, you know, the zeitgeist like this. We always thought that we were going to be an underground band. You know, our whole goal was just to be a band that at the most could sell 250, 300 CDs, 300,000 <laughs> CDs. And then we could just be able to tour, you know, that was our uh. fucking ceiling. And then, you know, God went and ruined that shit for us, man. <laughs> I, I, so I, you know, I love the fact that we have, infiltrated different parts of ever, movies, music, comics, art. I mean, everything. And we've, we've influenced so many different styles, people with different styles, whether it's country or hip hop or, you know, death metal. I mean, we've, we've really inspired so many people. And for whatever reason, I, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of that, you know, and I'm also proud of the fact that we're still, here at a at this level that you know i would have never expected i mean if you'd have told me this you know 15 years ago i'd have laughed in your fucking face dude <laughs> it's like you're still doing it after how many years and you're still selling out arenas and you know doing stadiums with your own fucking festival i no <laughs> not for us i i'm still tripping on it do you know why I, no, I don't. I really don't. I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm stoked about it, you know, and maybe it's one of those things like, I don't want to know. Like, I don't want to know. I don't want to figure it out because then maybe I'll chase it, mm. you know, and I don't want to chase it. I've never tried to chase an idea or a trend or something that didn't come from my own head. And I would rather appreciate it than try to understand it. That's really healthy. I mean... But is that a mindset shared with the band? I think so. You know, well, I mean, Clown... The great thing about everybody in the band, and maybe this is the key, we're, we're never turned back around looking at what we've done. We're always facing ahead, looking at what's next. You know, I mean, we just wrapped up our contract with Roadrunner, you know, and now all we're thinking about is what do we do? You know, like nobody's panicked. Nobody's freaking out. We all just started talking about, you know, possibly going old school and writing an album in, in the room again. Like, Sick. see what fucking happens. And I'm like, fuck yeah, dude. I mean, because we've all done the part and parcel writing. You know, we've done it. Um, you know, technology has made it very easy to do. And that, and there's nothing wrong with it, especially if you get the the basis of the demo, and then you get everything, everybody in the same room, and then you work on it as a band. It can give it that organic vibe, but there's a wholly different energy that comes from collaborating in the room, because then every accident is a gift. Every fucking like skip of something is like, ooh, do that again. You know, there's, I mean, people forget just how exciting that can be, you know, when a mistake becomes the main riff and you're just like, oh, where the shit did that come from? You know, that's the stuff that still gets us excited, you know, is like what's going to be next. And because of that, we've really never done any celebratory shit, you know, like the 20th or the 25th or the 30th, like any of that stuff. We are just now starting to talk about doing something to celebrate the first album, you know, next, cause next year's the 25th anniversary, Damn. which fucks with my head. And, but we, but we haven't figured out what that is yet. There are like no solid plans. Um, we all, we're taking a break because we've been touring for two years straight. I'm firing up my solo thing for CMF two, but right now next year is, is kind of open for Slipknot. What are you taking with you from your last two bands that 
besides your voice right. that you're applying to CMFT, which, by the way, you can listen to on Amazon Music. Link mm. in the description below. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, this is just me leaning into my inner singer-songwriter, to be honest. Because honestly, since I was a kid, that's all I've really wanted to be is just write songs that then I can play for people. That's I, and that's as as it's as it's as simple as it's ever been. You know, do I enjoy being a front man? Yes. Do I enjoy you know playing live? One hundred percent. Do I love the studio and do I love being creative and weird and yeah, of course. But to me, if the song isn't there, don't even talk to me. I don't, I don't care. You know, there's a reason why I release the stuff that I release. And it's because all the shit that I don't like, I don't release. Everything I put out is the stuff that I want you to hear that I love and that I'm proud of after that do with it what you will. And that's all that a singer songwriter does is they toil and they worry at that fucking song until they know it's perfect. And for me, that's what it's all about is writing a song that will entertain, that gets stuck in somebody's head and that will be just fun to play live, you know? So that's what CMFT and CMF2 kind of represents, no matter the genre, whether it's heavy or, you know, the kind of Irish country stuff that I write, uh, the punk stuff that I've, you know, finally been able to kind of do. It's because I love those styles, but I also love writing songs. And I know that when I write something, it's going to naturally generate that sort of genre that I can hear in my head. And with CMFT, I can fucking do anything, you know, whereas with Slipknot, it's kind of a very specific vibe. With this, I can do anything. And if people don't like it, fine that's that's i'm not going to stop doing it it's not for them exactly it's for me because if i don't get to do that i'll fucking lose my mind that for so many reasons makes a project like that the most personal now right yeah oh 100 you know so and maybe it's because slipknot's such a collective and this is just you exactly and i don't have to worry about being the boss but with with this man i mean i'm the main songwriter i'm i'm the one who I, you know, I put my band together, even though they're friends, they're, they were, they were specifically picked because I know they can play anything and they are the very best at what they do. Um, I co-produced it with Jay Rustin. I designed the fucking artwork. I have written all of the videos. Like it all comes from my brain. So it's very, very personal to me and it's very important, you know? Almost to the point where I have to kind of make myself back off because if I don't include the hubris, it will trigger something in me that's ugly. So explain that. Well, I mean, it's, I'm an addict. I always, I have been for, you know, 25 years now. I, I, don't drink. I don't do drugs. I don't smoke. I don't really do anything anymore except for coffee. Coffee. Um, and there's a reason that I tend to go crazy when I'm on certain chemicals is because my ego has a tendency to blow the fuck up. And if I, and I know that's something that I don't want, it makes me feel like shit when I lean into those moments and alcohol allows me to lean in those moments and I don't want it in my life, you know? So I try to rein in certain parts of that. Now you have to have a healthy ego to be able to do this and do it well. And I appreciate that. And I've embraced it and I've tried to get, because there's also that flip side to that douchebag coin where it's just like, Oh, I have no ego. You know, it's nothing. It's bullshit. And it's, that's in itself a pile of shit. Exactly. So I have to be honest and go, yes, I'm an attention whore and I love the attention. However, there's only a certain amount of it that I want because I like the fact that I have a normal life. I like the fact that my kids aren't dicks. I like the fact that my wife and I really like each other and care about each other. I like the fact that I don't have people camped outside my fucking house. 
I like the fact that I can walk into a Target with my daughter and buy her school clothes and maybe only one or two people bother me. I love that because that to me, that's my life. I like the fact that I can step into this superhero role, do my thing, and step right out, man. And that's fine. And, and that's because I don't need it for those reasons. Like, I don't need the attention. I like the fact that I can create and I get the attention for that. And then I pull back. Then what's fueling your personal stuff? Is it more of your, the life you I live? I mean, oh, dude, listen, I'm still a very angry fuck. There's still a lot of shit that pisses me off. I hate the fact that we live in a fucking world where there are no facts. They're just fucking crazy people with websites and fucking social media trying to make themselves sound smart by encouraging conspiracy fucking theories because they're tired of elitist pricks making them feel like shit because they don't know enough. That's what that whole fucking thing has happened. So that alone, I could write 12 fucking concept (laughs) albums on that shit, you know? There's always going to be things that inspire me. Real life is always going to throw shit at you. I'm also somebody who deals with depression, have since I was a kid. Um, I deal with physical depression, which is a whole other fucking level. Um, I deal with the PTSD from the abuse that I fucking dealt with when I was a kid. I deal with the urges of addiction. I deal with just normal shit. I deal with the fact that For fucking eight years, I was married to the wrong woman and it sucked and it was a very toxic relationship and it ate a part of me that I don't know if I'll ever get back. Yeah. Is that a regret you carry? I can't regret it because we have a daughter together and we, I I think at this point we both realized that it was a big mistake. It ended very ugly, but we both love our daughter. And because of that, we're able to communicate and we try to keep a lot of that away from her. You know what I mean? It's changed the way I look at life. You know what I mean? Like because one wrong, one wrong, you know, decision. And then you wake up one day and you're like, I don't even know who the fuck I am. You know, I mean, and it's bad, man. It will twist you out. To the point where when you get away from it, you are now this psychotic ball of emotion that is just trying to figure out what gives you joy now. You know what I mean? And and that's one of the reasons why I'm not on social media anymore is because I did a deep dive on social media and slipped into some habits that I wasn't proud of. You know what I mean? Instead of, you know, because as someone who is at a certain level, you can't really go to bars or or date or whatever. It's very easy to fucking slip into DM shit, you know? And that's what I did for, you know, probably about four months. And at the end of it, I was just like, I'm more miserable now than I was before I started fucking doing this. And that's where you kind of realize where it's like, man, I was so bereft of things in my life that I was looking for shit and I didn't still didn't find it. I was like just looking for a distraction. Well, there were a lot of distractions out there. You know what I mean? And I mean, obviously I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't do anything like that. It wasn't gnarly, gnarly, but it was enough that I wasn't proud of myself. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And when I stepped back and realized that, I was just like, okay, I need to start looking in and start looking out. Because until then, I'm not going to be any use for anybody, you know? And that's when I started going back to therapy, started talking about it, started, you know, kind of putting the pieces of myself back together. And it was a fucking arduous process, man. Are you using your solo projects to manage any of this? I mean, a little bit, you know? I mean... I mean, the great thing with Slipknot is I can just go, you know, and it's all fucking there, you know, but then CMFT is more about the subtleties, you know what I mean? Because you can have the same conversation, but with Slipknot, it's a little darker and it's a little easier to kind of get rid of those toxicities. 
with CMFT, there's a melancholy that you can kind of lean into a little more and a solemnness that maybe can kind of go either way, whether it's, you know, the, the positive or the negative. It's also great that I can write real songs for people like my wife. I can write songs about my kids, you know, I mean, it's, I don't, it doesn't have to be gnarly 24 seven. It can be just, you know, I want to write a song for my wife. I want to sing the song that I sang for her the day we got married. You know, like that's the stuff that CMFT provides. It's special though. It is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't know, but you uh, had a really intense collection of Spider-Man figurines. Oh, you, yeah. Yeah. Very, yeah. But like I, you were obsessed, uh, right? Yeah. I mean, at, at this point in my life, I can look back and go, was that a, just another addiction? <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but at the same time, part of that was triggered from the fact that when I was growing up, I was we were very poor, so I didn't have a lot of toys, man. So, and I the thing the toys that I did have, I cherished, you know. So when I got some what I call coin of the realm, I went and I indulged myself in a lot of this stuff. Like I bought, com it wasn't just action figures. I bought a ton of comics. Um, I went and, and collected like every fucking movie that I could think of. I bought a shit ton of books. Like I fed those beasts, you know, whereas some people buy cars and houses and shit. I was, you know, I was affordable in what I <laughs> bought, you know. I wasn't trying to buy, you know, a, the you know, the million dollar copy of Amazing Fantasy number 15. You know, I wasn't doing that. I was just like, you know what? I'll get the Repro. You know, it's five bucks. I'll take that and I'll be able to read the first Spider-Man story because that's what Amazing Fantasy number 15 is, the first appearance of Spider-Man. So I was just, you know, indulging my geekness. But what people don't realize is that I had started that collection before I even got signed. Like, so I was... Yeah, you were working on it, like, when you were a kid, though. Yeah. I mean, I, when, when I started... Well, I, I started buying action figures when I was about 19, really. You know, I, I started kind of collecting them. But when I got a steady... When I had steady jobs, I would set aside money for my rent and shit. <laughs> and then the rest of it... I would basically spend on trying to, I would go to like all these mom and pop shops. I would drive hours that's around so Iowa. Well, that's one of the reasons why I don't do it anymore is because it's so easy to find that shit now. Yeah. Before it was the hunt, you know, <laughs> so like true. you go and you're, you're digging in the back of this fucking dirt shop in the middle of fuck off Iowa. And you're like, <gasps> it's the fucking, you know, it's the, it's the Marvel superheroes version of venom that has the slime that pops out of his fucking face. I don't have that one. I found it. You know, like that to me, was part of the love, was the hunt. Do you still have your collection? I have some of it. And one of the reasons why I'm selling the 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 larger uh the larger part of it is because uh someone who I knew who was actually watching my house for me was selling my shit Wait. out of my back yeah, out what? of my back door. The fuck? Yeah. So there are big pieces of my collection that I'll never have back. And the sad thing is, is because my collection was so big, I'm not sure which ones are missing. Okay. And after that, it's kind of like when you have your car stolen and you get it back and you're just like, yeah, you don't just, want it anymore. Yeah. Well, it's not that you don't want it. It's just, it just doesn't, doesn't dry. It doesn't feel yeah. the same. You know, it's like we're a little fucked up. And, uh, you know, somebody probably ball bagged your seat. You just never know, you know? So, um, have you had somebody like go into your collection and like tag it all and I did. itemize it? I know? had it. I had it all fucking, but the, the, the great thing is, is with apps, you can fucking do anything these days. So I had it all, uh, scanned in this action figure app that I had for collectibles. And then there was a glitch and it erased Everything I had fucking put in there, and I just went, oh. <laughs> so what I've done is I've pulled aside the stuff that means something to me, which is really just a handful of it. Other than, the, other than that, everything else was just compulsion. 
It was just like, oh, there's a new spider series. I'm going to get this. When it got to like the Spidey Aqua Force, which was very weird. Like I was like, at this point, Toy Biz will just put fucking <laughs> Spider-Man on anything. I was like, uh, maybe I don't need this, but it's got Spider-Man, so I'll have to fucking have it. <laughs> and once I got past that, and then I had all of the McFarlane stuff, you know, Movie Maniacs, like one through seven. So and uh, what all is your collection valued at? I have no idea. I don't. It's not really even about value for me. It's just the collection. I love it. How you know? big is it? Oh, it's forty boxes. Holy shit! No, fifty. Sorry, that's my bad. Um, are, are they on display or? No, I used to have them on display, and then I my it outgrew my house. Like I didn't know where to put it, so they're just in box. <laughs> and that's another reason why I'm selling most of it is because they've just been sitting in boxes. So how are you selling it? A friend of mine's handling it. Uh, he's actually right now starting to kind of put the the finishing touches on something that we're going to actually put up. I, I think it's on eBay. Sick. But I'm not sure because I was thinking about doing like an auction. But then I was like, eh, you know, I did that with some guitars of mine uh, a, f a few years ago. when we were able to raise some money for charity. And we did really well, but then the action figures, I tried to bring the action figures to them and they, they only really cared about the ones that had value. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's not what this is. You know, this is about helping people maybe plug some holes in their collections or whatever. Cause there's, I've so fucking me. I have the entire tick collection. Oh. You know, the tick. Yeah. What I have the whole collection and I bought them when they were out. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm a fucking psychopath. Yeah. <laughs> it's awesome. Well, you say awesome. I say, fuck. You know? <laughs> Are you able to meet any of the designers and the like, the people who create these comics and have them put this work into the mass? I've met guys? some, man. And like, like I, yeah, because, I mean, I'm such a, I'm such a massive comic fan, you know? Like, I, I was able to meet uh, John Romita Jr., which was really fucking cool, you know? I met some of my favorite writers uh I, I met grant morrison which was crazy i met uh warren ellis uh garth ennis like i i've i've been able to kind of and i have the same feeling about those dudes that i do about my musical heroes you know like it's and that's so when i meet them i'm like <laughs> you know some <laughs> fucking total dick right but it's very, it's very cool, man. Um, I, I, I'm just, at this point, I'm just, I'm, it's one of the things that I love the most about what I get to do is that I'm able to meet the people who inspired me and let them know how much they inspired me and that I appreciate it. It's cool because there's not many people in this world that actually have the opportunity to like put something on and become a su superhero to somebody else. Right, right. And it's like, you're a fan of it, but you also are that to so many people. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, I I love the fact that we're still inspiring people like that. You know, I've had so many people, you know, I guess Demi Lovato's a fan, which I never knew. I was like, what? Okay, what do you, but I mean, people like Jelly Roll have, have oh. a bit, like, they've gone out of their way to say something. So I'm like, well, now I got to hit him up and do a song with him. Yeah. Because you know? I think that'd be fucking cool. And I'm the guy oh, that geez. if it interests me, I'm going to do it. You know, like I don't give a fuck about money or anything like that. Like if we put something cool together, let's fucking try it. You what know? about a collaborations project? I've been talking about that actually for a minute. And it's, you know, it's something that I love to do. And maybe it's because I'm never sure what people will think of the stuff that I write until I put it out that I've never taken a lot of the stuff that I write and try to have other people come and do it, like be on my stuff. The first time I'd really done it was CMFT must be stopped. And even that song was supposed to be satire. You know what I mean? Like the, the record label heard that song and flipped out and I was like, wait, no, this is, this isn't supposed to be serious. You know, like this is supposed to be something fun. And then people thought that the rest of the album was going to sound like that. And I just went, oh, for fuck's sake. But the cool thing was is I got to do a, t a song with Tech and with uh, fucking Kid, Bookie. So that, to me, is the best thing that came out of that song was the fact that I was able to do something with, you know, some good friends of mine. And by the way, like, the product, it hits different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but at the same time, it's like if I did... 
uh, a collaboration thing. I don't know what the fuck it would be, you know, like, cause I have so many people that I would love to write with. I mean, I've been talking about doing a dark acoustic EP cool, and having some friends come in. Uh, I reached out to, I've, I've had people reach out to Frank Carter. Um, I've, I've talked to, to Nurgle from behemoth. Um, Duff, I've hit up Duff. He and I go way back, man. So, it's just one of those things that I would love to do something with some people that I know, some people who are friends of mine, some people who inspire me. Like I would, God, man, if I, but my list is so big. Like I would love to do something with Elvis Costello, Ani DeFranco. Like at this point, it's just like, I have a list of that I need to cross off. And if I don't get it crossed off, then, you know, what else do I do? Start crossing. I'm yeah. working. I know, right? Uh, a CMF2, you can listen to it. Link in the description below. I know you're thinking yeah. things. Yes. I, I have a couple questions about CMF2. Okay. Someday I'll change your mind right into all I want to say. Yeah. Couldn't be any more opposite. Right. Where does like someday I'll change your someday I'll change your mind come from? So that's a song I wrote for my wife for her birthday. Okay. And when I debuted it, uh, it was at her birthday party. And I sat down at the piano and I, I played some of it and I had all of her friends do the, the woe part. Mm. So it was almost like three dimensional in a weird way. And then my wife just like bright red and she was like, fuck, you know, and this is the second album, the second, second album in a row that something I've written for her, I've played for her live before I actually recorded it because on the first album on CMFT, the song home is actually the song I wrote for her and that I played for her at our wedding when we got married. Uh, and it was just she and I, and we were out at uh, the Valley of Fire. And we just we just wanted something for us, you know? And, you know, I, I played it for her, and it, you know, it was just, it was the first song I'd really ever written for her. And I was able to play it on guitar, but then I played it on piano because I was teaching myself how to play. So then Someday I'll change, change Your Mind is based off of something that I had said to her when we first started dating um, because there were definitely moments that were tense because of the things that I had just come out of, you know? So I was kind of, I wasn't quite myself, but I was trying to get there, you know? And she was just like, you know, there are times where I don't believe you when you say these things. And I go, well, Someday I'll Change Your Mind, you know? And that line stuck with me and I wrote a song for that. And that was, you know, to me, the absolute antithesis to what all I want is hate was supposed to be. But again, it, the song is satirical. It's, it's actually a reaction to one of my least favorite songs on the planet, which was written by one of the greatest bands of all time. So I don't know if you, I don't know how what how big of a Beatles fan you are, but they're first of all one of the best bands that ever lived. Yeah, and what they did and what they accomplished in that short amount of time will never be replicated. I don't give a fuck what anybody fucking says. However, all you need is love is one of the biggest pieces of shit that I've ever heard in my life, and every time I fucking hear it, I feel like I'm being shot at. Let's put it that way. It's that bad. <laughs> <laughs> so that song, All I Want Is Hate, is actually a retort to that song. So if you listen to my song, it's a pseudo-reflection of that song. So if you listen to the way that the original is, is sung and written, listen to mine now, and it's almost like, it's, yeah, you just need to fucking like check them out. It's supposed to be like, basically fuck you this is this is how it's supposed to be is that why it's sung in the tone it's sung in yes it sounds like it's a and definitely- that's why it starts with this weird kind of piss take of like the 60s like a you know kind of, like a circus that weird, kind of swing music. exactly yeah, yeah. yeah interesting why do you hate all you need is love so much because it's saccharine hippie garbage is why it's this <laughs> fucking are you fucking all you need is love how about food 
oxygen too you know let's, let's put some clothes on those kids all you need is love get the fuck out of my face all I need is gas in my car let's write a fucking song about that no I guess you got a point there thank you you can listen to uh, CMF2 Amazon <laughs> Music waiting for you it will not be anywhere near the Beatles channel on it. <laughs> No, but seriously, though, there is a link in the description below to listen to all of Corey's music, including <laughs> Slipknot stuff, too. So it's waiting for you. There you go. You did mention that when you're on the road with Slipknot, you guys just kind of hop into it and you don't really need to knock the rust off, I think. Is yeah, what man. Said. Yeah. What's it like on tour now? Because you just toured without Clown, right? Yeah. I mean, that's that tough, man. I mean, and sadly, it's not the first time we've had to, to do it without certain people. Yeah. You know, I mean, we've had to tour over the years. Um, I mean, I remember Jim broke his wrist one time when he was fucking, he was riding, he was dirt biking or whatever. So we had to do a whole tour without him while he was in a cast, which was crazy. Um, clown has had to sit out a handful of times because of, you know, tragedies in his life and whatnot. And, or the fact, you know, he's, you know, taking care of his family, his wife. Um, it's tough, you know, it's, it's weird when you're up there. Yeah. And not everybody's there. You know, it's, it's the only thing I can attribute it to is if you tried to walk down the street just by hopping on one leg, mm -hmm. there's obviously something that's supposed to be there. But if you're not allowed to use it, then it doesn't feel right. You're still getting there, but it doesn't feel right. The f Because we love the fans so much and because we know that they would be crushed if we you know, canceled, we do our best to try to get there with or without everybody, mm -hmm. you know? But a family's also having each other's backs. You well, know? exactly. And to bow out, you're never not going to. Exactly. And for him, it was a very gratifying feeling knowing that, well, of course we've got his back, you know, stay home, take care of your family. We'll handle it. It's fine. And there was never going to be any animosity no guilt trips, no bullshit, because it's family first, yeah. no matter what. And and by the way, family first at home, but the family that you have on the road and that band is should have the ability to exactly. cover you, for you and you don't feel a thing. Well, exactly. And that's something that we've really started to kind of realize again is that, fuck, we do have each other's back, you know, no matter what, you know. The people in the band who didn't, aren't in the band anymore. So can you attribute that, that to why you've been around for so long? Probably, you know, um, it's that it's also the fact that we still care. You know, there are a lot of bands or there are some bands who have been able to achieve a certain level of success that just stop caring at some point. And they write what I can only refer to as kind of going through the motions music. You know, it doesn't have it. it, it it's a, it's kind of like the difference between uh, Beyond Burgers and Real Burgers. You know, it's like, eh, it looks the same. It's not quite the same, you know, not that one is better than the other. It's just, you know, one is synthetic. And when you see those bands, you can instantly feel it. You're just kind of like, oh, fuck, you know, it's like. It's, oh, they're playing that going for a beer song. Better go for a beer, you know? So it's it's stuff like that that still inspires us to try and write and perform at a certain level, you know? Now, when we lose that, maybe it'll be time to hang the mask up. But until then, I mean, we're still all very committed to the level of, you know, creativity, um, a level of um, quality that we put into it, you know, even when we're not able to kind of record all at the same time, we still care. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's important to us, but will Slipknot always be Slipknot as long as you're around. Like if there was eight other guys around you, is it still Slipknot? I think as long as there are certain people in the band, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, Cause right now, I mean, we have this, the, we have six original people, uh, or no five, excuse me. And those five, we've kind of been the core for like the longest time. You know what I mean? Um, the people who we lost, obviously 
we would do anything to have him back, but you kind of you kind of get on with it, if, you know, when yeah. it comes down to stuff like that. Um, I think if I think if any more people left, it it wouldn't be the same. You know, I know I've said in the past that you know somebody could replace me if I physically couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've had the guys in the band kind of push back on that and go, Taylor, shut the fuck. What are you talking about? And I'm they're like, hey, listen. To me, Slipknot is a state of mind. You know, st- Slipknot is a is a, an emotion. It's a it's it's something in your soul that you have to have. If what if there was a kid out there who had that same kind of ferocity? He didn't have that. and had the same chops, man. You know, like yeah, but nobody could do what Chester Bennington could do, and like I don't think anybody can really do what you can do. There's a reason you guys. I mean, are who you are. thank you for that. I appreciate that. But at the same time, I don't know. I, I'd, if let's just if this band wanted to c- continue without me, and if I couldn't do it, I would go. I would do everything I could to help it continue. Well, because the mission of Slipknot's bigger than you, exactly. And that's and I guess that's what I'm trying to say is that if I just couldn't give to it the same level that I wanted to you know it's that it's the old adage you know the the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak if that were the case then i would 100 percent help them find a replacement and give them my blessings to go out there you know now i'm still pretty spry you know i'm like i'm not dead yet but you know um i probably got another 10 years of touring like this you know five to ten so as long as that's the case, I'll still be here. I'll still be doing it. Um, but, you know, but if it ever came down to making people choose between, you know, me and Slipknot, I, I mean, I I would totally push them back out there to get out there, you know? When you're on stage, like you were talking about the big family, do you ever look back and still think you're going to see Joey back there, look to the left or right and think you're going to see the pig? I mean, there are definitely moments where, especially during certain songs, but I remember little moments that me and Joey would have, Yeah, you know, and we would always kind of look at each other and we'd fucking make each other laugh, you know. Other times where, you know, Paul, Jesus Christ, dude, he was just so <laughs> ridiculous. I've never seen a, a person more late for everything in my life. I mean, He'd be proud and of you he today. would just, but he was, but he was never like late, late. He was always just on time, you know? Yeah. It's like there's 60 seconds in that last minute, and he was going to fucking push it right up to, like, 59, you know? And then, what? I'm here. It's fine. And I'm like, oh, you fuck, you know? Yeah. Um, you could always tell <laughs> you could always tell when Paul was coming back out on stage because you'd always see the cigarette smoke blowing from right around the, the, the – um, uh, the set carts, and then here he comes, and he'd be pulling it because he'd be cheesing a boat between every song, dude. Like he'd smoke a whole fucking pack during a set, and then he'd always just be, and then pull his mask down and walk back out. And I was like, dude, you can't go a whole show without just like. And he's just like, he's like, why should I? I ain't singing? Get your fucking ass out there! And I'm like, you prick. But I always knew where I could go to bum a smoke. <laughs> He's bro. always had one. Yeah. It's so cool to be able to look back and just have those memories with those guys. I mean, and that's the shit you cherish, man. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously there were there were bad times, yeah, but there course. were so many good times, man. And that's, you know, when, when you get to that kind of point in your life, that's the shit that you look at. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. people talk about rose-colored glasses, but it's also appreciation for what you've helped to, you know, make, oh, you know, yeah. like if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have been able to do half the shit that we did, man. So I just, I love the fact that I got to spend that time with them. Yeah. I mean, you got kids that have never heard a Slipknot song wearing Slipknot t-shirts. Right. It must yeah. be crazy but to see that. Don't you owe it to them to keep Slipknot alive? Right. Well, I mean, that's part of it, you know, I mean, when you're responsible for th- something that is even bigger than you are, yeah, like uh, like we were talking about, to me it would almost be 
selfish to be like, you know, what well, you can't continue if, if I'm not there, you know, like it's, it's God that, can you hear my stomach? Jesus Christ. It sounds like an air siren going off. Like, right. It's like, <laughs> I'm like, fuck, I'm so sorry. It's like here I'm in this heartfelt, you know, <laughs> answer and all of a sudden, <laughs> like there's a cow dying inside me. Um, no, man, it's, I mean, so much about Slipknot is so big at this point, man, that, I mean, it's, it's, it's a genre into itself. It's yeah. an institution to itself. It's got its own festival. It's got its own website. It's got its own life beyond all of this, you know, <laughs> like, I don't know if I would want it to stop if I wasn't in it. You know what I mean? Like I would totally. want it to go on. That doesn't mean that I would stop making music. You know, like I just if it, if I physically couldn't rise to that Slipknot level, I wouldn't want to hold it back. You know what I mean? That's yeah. what it comes down to. I would never want to limit the memory of of what people want when they expect something from it. You know? True. There is a band out there. I won't name them, but when they get on stage now, I'm like, guys, it's time to time to pack it up i mean there are many of those bands dude yeah. I, and it pains me like, it's hard to watch there's so many and uh, there are some bands that can physically do it and they just don't yeah you know and you're just like oh fuck man yeah <laughs> it's just stop all of Corey's music and slipknot's music waiting for you on amazon music link in the description below final thoughts very last question on yep. your solo shows when did you start covering the spongebob theme song Fuck man, like I that was a one off, dude. Like I learned that for Griffin, like when he was ten. He was <laughs> he was like the biggest SpongeBob fan. So I vicariously became a massive SpongeBob fan because he was watching it all the time and I was like, This show's really good. So <laughs> when I first started doing um acoustic shows because I was promoting my books. I learned it because I knew Griff was going to be there. Yeah. And I had him come up on stage and I was like, okay, we're all going to sing a song. Are you ready? And he's just like, I mean, he's little, little, you know, he's got his glasses on. He looked like the kid from fucking Jerry Maguire. Like that's what he <laughs> looked like. Right. Little toe head, weird, like little tough, you know, and he is just, you know, and it was in Birmingham uh, in the UK. So, there's probably about 900 people out there. And I go, are you ready, kids? And he goes, <laughs> like, he look, he's like, oh, shit. We're doing it in the whole audience. I, I, got, I mean, I just went, oh, fuck. Now, fast forward, what, 12 years later. Yeah. And it has become a real pain in my ass. I would assume so. Okay. <laughs> I, and I say it at every show because every time somebody sees me with an acoustic, they admit it's SpongeBob. It's like SpongeBob has replaced the Skinner, you know, or Freebird, you know? And I'm just like, oh, for fuck's sake. And I just look at him and I go, you miserable pricks. Yeah. I was like, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've written hundreds of songs and you want me to play a minute of somebody else's shit that I learned <laughs> just to placate my song. But, but, but a, a theme song to an animated cartoon that you don't have a single link. link I don't have any, I didn't write the fucking thing. You know, oh, people dude. think that I wrote that song oh. and I'm like, what is this is fucking ridiculous, man. I mean, your voice does kind of have the same tone as the intro to, I mean, which is great because that's Clancy Brown yeah. singing it. Yeah. It's the Kurgan. <laughs> I'm like, fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> Ramirez. That's such a great, gnarly you. fucking line in that movie. Oh, yeah. Well, you created the monster. So. I know, but nobody wants to see Monster no more. They want Taylor. I'm chopped liver. Well, if you want Shady, this is what I'll give you. Boosh! A little bit of me, but since I'm hot, look here. Oh, you can find all of Eminem's music on uh, Amazon. <laughs> music. You can check the link below. <laughs> <laughs> dude thank you so much for giving us your time and energy today. dude no it's all good man like sorry again that my flight got canceled so i couldn't Why? be here like sooner but well that's really ridiculous because the fact that you were here on time in early early like you're very not kind most people don't give a shit and they're well some people like, are pricks dude i don't know if you've noticed that 
Some people aren't worth the fucking skin they're printed on. Amen. Yeah. And just like that full circle. Corey Taylor, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Hydrate. Stay hydrated. <laughs>